So good morning once again, and we welcome all of you that are here, as well as those who are joining us on Facebook Live, to our worship service at Longwood Hills Congregational Church. We are an inclusive spiritual community seeking to live out a more just and generous Christianity. So we, we welcome the entire human family because we truly believe that life is a gift and love is the point. And we are uh, reaching out to people with God's love to enable them to know how deeply cherished, treasured, valued, and loved they are as uh, God's image bearers and people, children who are filled with God's holy breath. And so we welcome you here today, no matter who you are or where you are on life's journey, and we're glad that you uh, are with us. This morning, we do celebrate the Sacrament of Holy Communion and we invite all those who feel comfortable uh, to come forward when the ushers direct you uh, and to um, share in this sacrament of grace and God's love. Once again, I just lift up that Willy Wonka has um, two shows um, at the end of the camp, and one will be on Friday evening, the uh, 18th of June at 7 p.m. here in the sanctuary, and the other, uh, the very next day, Saturday, June the um, 19th at 2 p.m. And we do need volunteers to help with those shows, and so if you can um, help with that, either email the church office or speak with Sue McMahon. Once again, we are very grateful that um, we have the... Um, contributions to the AC fund as we're almost there. So we're a little over $9,000 remaining and want to thank everybody who has helped us reach our, that where we are at this point right now. Uh, and just remind you that um, our offering um, is in the boxes in the lobby area as you leave this morning. Uh, and just thank you for your continued support uh, for our church. As we prepare for worship, let us hear the words from Psalm 139. Lord, you have searched me and you know me. You know when I sit and when I rise. You perceive my thoughts from afar. 
You discern my going out and my lying down. You are familiar with all my ways. Before a word is on my tongue, you, Lord, know it completely. You hem me in behind and before, and you lay your hand upon me. Such knowledge is too wonderful for me, too lofty for me to attain. So where can I go from your spirit? Where can I flee from your presence? If I go up to the heavens, you are there. If I make my bed in the depths, you are there. If I rise on the wings of the dawn and settle on the far side of the sea, even there your hand will guide me, your right hand will hold me fast. If I say, surely the darkness will hide me and the light become night around me, even the darkness will not be dark to you and the night will shine for you like the day. For you created my inmost being. You knit me together in my mother's womb. I praise you because I am fearfully and wonderfully made. This is a God whose love will not let us go and a God we worship today and now through our singing.
Longwood Hills Congregational Church, we celebrate open communion, which means that we invite anyone who desires a closer relationship with Jesus Christ to come forward and to join with us in receiving these gifts of God's uh, amazing grace for each one of us. But we want you to feel comfortable either in coming forward and in joining us or remaining where you are seated. All precautions have been uh, taken to ensure your safety as well um, with those who will be serving you. As I said in my message last week, <clears throat> there's some things that we have to settle on and, and have to be in agreement on uh, as we move forward. And one of those things is that as creation, uh, as, uh, as God's creation, each one of us, created in God's image and created in God's likeness, filled with God's holy breath. <clears throat> and if we can settle on that, that that's who we are because that's in our founding story, then we can also move to the place where we understand ourselves as we've talked about in that story that we, we are good. In that founding story, at the end of the first chapter, it says God stepped back after making, creating everything and said, it is very good. We are good. And we lose, though, unfortunately, that understanding of ourselves, that self-image in a sense, because in chapter 2, of course, Adam and Eve uh, take a left turn, wrong turn, right turn, whatever it was, away from God. We remember and we emphasize that story rather than the founding story that no matter what, we are good because even when Adam and Eve leave the Garden of Eden, they don't go alone. God doesn't say, get out of here. God goes with them. He's always been with them. Just like Psalm 139. Where can I go to be away from your spirit? I can't go anywhere. So we, in, in, in that sense, we are all connected with God. All of us. We're connected with each other as well. Now, it's not easy to hold, hold on to that vision, is it? Because we live in a very contentious world and we're always trying to define ourselves over and against somebody else, some other group, some other tribe, some other uh, political party. We, we are not them and they are not us. But the reality is that's an illusion because we really are united and connected. And I want you just to think for a moment with me the elements in this communion, how connected we are. You take this bread, this pita bread. Think about it. How connected we are in this. Because where this started off was as a seed, right? Planted by a farmer. And over a period of time, there was enough rain. God's good nature there was enough sunshine that caused that wheat to grow and thrive. And then it took another person, maybe that same farmer, to harvest it, right? And then he took it to the mill where they milled it, completely different people. Again, it's transported to the bakery, correct? And then when it's at the bakery, there's somebody else we have never met never maybe even will meet in our lives, who makes it into various kinds of bread, pita being one of them. And then it's put in and transported by somebody else to a store who's, where somebody else puts it on the shelf, displays it, where somebody, I'm going to guess, Deb Perry went and she bought it and brought it here. And then some other good folks cut it up and put it, in the tray, and then some other folks are going to stand up here and they're going to hand it to you. <laughs> Think of where this juice came from. Think of the process. How many hands touched this? How many places has it been before it ever got to us? Why in the world 
Do we in our nation want to lift up the individual over and against? Now, that doesn't mean we don't celebrate, as Paul tells us, in the body of Christ, when one person succeeds, we all succeed. And, but when one person has sorrow, we all have sorrow. But somewhere along the line, we said, ah, to be a success, that's what we thrive for. That's what we yearn for. Stand up over and above the crowd because you're the one. You pulled yourself up by your bootstraps. You made it on your own. You're self-made. There is no self-made. Not in this world. Think of all the people we depend upon in order for us just to eat. Now, that doesn't mean some other people don't work hard and have initiative. I'm not putting that down one bit. Some people do. God bless them. They take God's talents and they live them out to the fullest, and we, we celebrate that, of course. But never to the point that we're disconnected. We, we depend, and that's why Jesus, that's why the church is called the body of Christ, connected. Different parts, different talents, different gifts. But in the fullness of time, he took the bread, he broke it, and he said, if I'm going to feed my body, I'm going to have to break it up into little pieces so that you can, all the parts of my body can be nourished and renewed and refreshed. Also, after supper, he took the cup, and he says, if there's going to be refreshment, if the thirst of my body will be quenched and all the various aspects and parts of it, it'll be because they're connected with me through my life, life-giving blood. Through the broken bread, we participate in the body of Christ. We who are many become one. Through the cup of blessing, we all drink deeply from the same spring of life. Let us pray. It is at this table, wondrous God, that we discover the illusion of our separateness from each other. We celebrate that you have various expressions of yourself through all of us, unique talents and gifts that we all have, but you remind us that we are all connected to you we all draw our life from you, and we all live because of the many efforts of other people. And so in this sacrament, as we celebrate today, we thank you for this gift that feeds all of us, that nourishes all of us, that refreshes all of us, that we may go forth to live a life for all of us, making sure that we reach out to those who are marginalized and less fortunate in need, as well as we celebrate the life and the love that you supply in all of your creation and the environment around us. So we bring with us many, many prayers. And we ask you to hear us as we pray these from the silence of our hearts. O Lord, hear our prayer. As we join our voices together in the prayer that your son taught us, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. 
Amen. The gifts of God for the people of God. Come, taste, and see how good the Lord is, for all things are now ready. As servants of Christ, go and share this. If you would, as people come forward, as you're sitting there, hold them in your prayers. As you return to your seat, hold others in your prayers.
And now may this the life of Christ that unites us one to another, reminds us how connected we all are to each other. May this life of Christ be to you your peace, your joy, your energy, your refreshment, and your mission to share throughout the days of this week. Amen. And now Jerry Ross will come forward and share in our uh, children's message. Good morning. We're going to ask the children to stay seated with your parents. We'll ask the children online to, to gather around the computer screen and we'll continue our talk about the senses. Miss Sue has talked about our sense of smell when we came into the the sanctuary and we smelled all those candles burning, it smelled so great. She's talked about the sense of hearing, where we need to practice hearing God's word. And today I want to talk about the sense of sight, of vision. And so we have two eyes. And when we open those eyes, we can see the beauty of God all around us. Sometimes that's in nature, just the trees, the mountains. Sometimes that's in the animals that surround us, and we get to see them very clearly and experience the beauty of God's creation, the ocean, the vastness of the ocean. But sight sometimes needs a little help, especially when you get a little older like me. You need help like your glasses, because sometimes things can look a little fuzzy. Sometimes they don't really come into focus until you get a little help with your glasses. Sight can also be confusing when we think we see very clearly, but maybe we don't. Because I've got a number six here. But if I turn it just a different way and look at it, it kind of looks like a nine. And if I turned it this way, this side of the room may see a six, and they're right. But this side of the room could see a nine, and they're right too. Both looking at the same thing, but from a different perspective. And then, just when we see things perfectly, nighttime comes, and it gets dark. And you can't see anything in the dark. You need a light. You need to be able to bring light into the darkness. Well, as Christians, we have one solution to all of those issues and challenges that happen with sight. It's called the Bible. Because in those times where things are a little fuzzy and we don't see things quite clearly, we can go to the Bible and it will help us see things more clearly. Sometimes when there's people who disagree about what they actually see and, and we're looking for a different perspective, the Bible can do that too. And in those times of darkness, sometimes when we're afraid and we shut our eyes and everything's dark, sometimes just when life gets dark, the Bible can bring light into that darkness because Jesus said, I'm the light of the world. So, even though you have perfect vision, sometimes when you're struggling with what you see, you can always go to the Bible. But if you go at night, be sure that you bring your glasses and a nightlight, okay? Let's pray. Lord, we thank you for all of our senses, the senses that allow us to embrace the wonderful creation that you've made. We thank you for our eyesight in that we can see the beauty around us and in the people around us. So this week, help us to use our vision to see your creation for the first time. Help us to use our, our vision to see your face in those that we meet and to hear your voice in those that we talk to. And we ask this through your son Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. And now you can go to Sunday school. Thou 
Scripture reading this morning comes from Mark 10. Then they came to Jericho. As Jesus and his disciples, together with a large crowd, were leaving the city, a blind man, Bartimaeus, that is the son of Timaeus, was sitting by the roadside begging. When he heard that it was Jesus of Nazareth, he began to shout, Jesus, son of David, have mercy on me. Many rebuked him and told him to be quiet, but he shouted all the more, Son of David, have mercy on me. Jesus stopped and said, Call him. So they called to the blind man, Cheer up, on your feet, he's calling you. Throwing his cloak aside, he jumped to his feet and came to Jesus. What do you want, to do, what do you want me to do for you? Jesus asked him. The blind man said, Rabbi, I want to see. Go, said Jesus, your faith has healed you. Immediately he received his sight and followed Jesus along the road. Here ends the reading. I'm very grateful that this week, at least, I uh, waited until Linda read the scripture before I jumped up here to preach about it, because, uh, you know, it's all about a frame of reference, and, and we have one now, thanks to Linda and thanks to Jerry. A uh, frame of reference for us is about being able to see, and Jesus giving, at least in this story, in our first reading of it, uh, Bartimaeus, who was blind, and Jesus giving him that ability. And as I said during the communion, there's some things that we need to agree upon, and if we can't agree, up, agree upon those, we, we're not going to be able to see together. And one of those things is simply that we are all connected. We're like that spider web, that when one vibration on uh, one end of it moves through and you can feel that and in the best sense of being a church we are that together we we know and we feel the joys that we all have and experience as the body of Christ and we also can feel the pain and that's one of the beautiful things about the church community when we get it right is that we have the ability to respond to each other in some incredibly loving and deep and meaningful ways. When we get it wrong, we cause hurt to each other. You know, the times that we forget to see, the times that we get, forget to listen, um, that's in all of our relationships, right? In those relationships, when we don't take the time to look and see or to listen, we hurt others or when others don't they can't see the pain in us or the joy celebrate the joy with us there's that 
there's that pain. So I, I know that somehow uh, probably uh, Don and, and Chris will let me know at the end of this service that, you know, we really could have just stopped with Jerry's children's message and we would have gotten what you want to say. And that's probably true, but, you know, I'm going to give it to you anyway. So here we have a story about a man who's blind and he's been begging. And he hears that Jesus is coming and he has this sense that in Jesus there's this ability to heal. In Jesus there's this ability to make life whole again for him. And so when he gets his chance, he cries out to him, even though the crowd is passing by. And it's a beautiful story because, you know, just earlier in this story, James and John, so go back and read that. James and John, the, the disciples of Jesus, go and ask him a question too. And Jesus' response is, what do you want me to do for you? And I'll return to that in a moment. Because when Bartimaeus is crying out, the crowd around him really see him as a nuisance, as an interruption to their celebration and their parade and their um, time with Jesus. This is a, a nuisance. This, stop yelling, you're disrupting. Bartimaeus is a saint for everybody who has a pain who needs that, needs to be heard. They need to be heard. And God bless people who have needs or have hurts or who have wants. And I know we do. We, we, we would rather not deal with them. You know how we say to people sometimes, it's not your time, hang on. Your time. It's just not convenient to be concerned about a racial problem in our country. It's, it's not convenient for us to deal with that. It's not convenient for us to deal with people who are struggling in the LGBTQ community. You'll get your time. Just hang on. Bear with us. In other words, be quiet about your needs. But they, the people won't. God bless them. That's going to come as it has. As it has. For all groups in our nation. That's one of the beauties of our nation, folks. And we might find ourselves on the other side. We might find ourselves saying, shh, not now. Maybe later. <laughs> Maybe when it's time. But you know, when somebody's in pain and when somebody has been um, oppressed, <laughs> we're really going to ask them to be quiet? The women's movement. Far too long. Far too long we have kept and tried to keep people in their place, like Bartimaeus. Shh! Not right now. Don't bother the master. But there was something in his, in his gut. There was a need, a hurt, a pain. Jesus, have mercy on me! And the beautiful thing about Jesus is when we cry from our gut, he hears. He hears anyway. He hears. Jesus stopped the parade. Call him. Now, if you follow those readings that we have, um, you know, and, and you go on, then there's this actor who reads them on um, BibleGateway.com. His name's Max McLean. Um, a, a really uh, beautiful voice, an actor's voice, you know, reading this. And this past week, I've never heard it read this way. Because um, I always read that passage something like this. People come and say, Barnabas, he's calling you. He's calling you. Come. Almost like they're excited that he's calling them. That they forgot somehow that they just a few minutes ago were trying to tell them to be quiet. But Max McLean picked up on that. So go home and, and, and go to Mark 10 and in BibleGateway.com. And there's this little speaker there. Click on that, and it'll come up, and Max McLean's voice will read it to you. And listen to how he says it. 
Because though he says it, and I won't do it justice, but I'm going to try anyway, you know. He says, the crowd said to Bartimaeus, Bartimaeus, come on. He's calling you. You got your wish. Almost annoyed. And that's, that's really kind of how I think they would have been. Annoyed. All right. You wouldn't shut up. Now he's calling you. And he comes to Jesus. And Jesus has this great question. What do you want me to do for you? Wow, is that ever packed? Is it? Do you ever think about what you want Jesus to do for you? Because it really causes us to reflect honestly about ourselves, what we would like Jesus to do for us. What do you want me to do for you? Lord, I want to see. My sight was taken away from me. I want to see the beauty of the sun. Did anybody get up? I got up uh, way before dawn this morning and took uh, somebody to an airport at 5 a.m. And they had the audacity to make me look at the moon. <laughs> I go, I'm just trying to get you to the airport so I can go back to bed. This moon was just this little sliver, like what they call it, a little fingernail or something. You know, and, and you know, when I stopped and I looked, it, it really was quite, quite interesting, quite beautiful. I want to see the sun. I want to see the green of bushes and I want to see the green of the grass and I want to see the beauty of people. I want to see their faces again. Jesus said, go. Your faith has made you well. He was able to physically see. But you know what the beauty of this story is? Jesus cured not only his physical blindness, he was, had the audacity to cure the crowd's blindness. All right? Think about that. Because when they looked at Bartimaeus, they had already assumed, they had already believed, all they could see was somewhere, somehow, Bartimaeus had sinned. And his blindness is the just reward for some bad thing that he did or that he, his parents did. Remember in the Gospel of John, when the disciples asked Jesus, there was a man who was born, of, born blind? And I always think this is the craziest question. Jesus, they asked Jesus, Jesus, who sinned, this man or his parents, that he was born blind? How can this guy sin before he's born? But that was the question. And that was the belief of the day. Their sight, their reading of Scripture. So I'm going to press Jerry a little bit on this because, you know, a lot of us read this and we come away with different ideas, <laughs> different understandings, different ways of seeing. Their way of reading Scripture was that this man, and it was common in that day, he had sinned. So why should Jesus... Even give him time. Here's the Holy One, the Master, walking through. And God doesn't have time. God's already dispensed punishment on this person for something he did wrong. That's all they could see. Until Jesus stopped. Letting them know that God does more than what their thoughts were. Remember in Isaiah 55... God says, my ways are not your ways. Your thoughts are not my thoughts. So when we got it all, we got God all figured out, folks. <laughs> we got to be careful. Jesus said, God stops. God listens. God sees. And no, this man did not sin. And, and no, it wasn't because of this man's sin that he was struck blind. See, far too often we can read this book and we can decide who's in and who's out. And we've done that to great pain and anguish of people. It was the congregational church, my folks, our forefather, fathers and mothers, the pilgrims, you know, they remember the pilgrims, God bless them, you know, who decided who was a witch and who wasn't. 
That's part of our heritage that we don't celebrate too much. How often have we told groups of people, you're not welcome here? And far too often, I don't know how it was when you were growing up, but when I was growing up, people went to church because they were good. And they wanted to show people they were good. So they went to church. And if you had problems, if your husband was an alcoholic or your wife was, was addicted to something or, or your, your son had been arrested the night before, you didn't go to church. You couldn't put your life out on display. You didn't talk about your problems, your humanness, your failings. You couldn't do that. You wouldn't be welcome. How can I face the congregation? How can I face these people? They got that idea from someplace. Because somebody read somewhere that, man, if you've got problems, you're not right with God, and you better get right with God. Because when you're right with God, it shows you're blessed. So that meant that we had to hide it. We couldn't share it. And when we hide it, I think it's Richard Rohr who says, pain that is not transformed is transferred. Think about that. Pain that we have... If it's, we don't transform it, if we don't let it be out there to be healed, to let others know it, guess what? We transfer it in our attitudes, in our beliefs, in our behavior, in our treatment of other people. We transfer it. So Jesus stops that day, and he comes, confronts the blindness of Bartimaeus, but he also confronts the blindness of that crowd who have interpreted Scripture to say, Bartimaeus, you're worthless. Bartimaeus, you don't matter to God. God's already pronounced judgment on you. You're done. You're finished. Just take it and be quiet. And how often have we done that? With this being Pride Month. And our brothers and our sisters in the LGBTQ community. Often have we done it not only to them but to their loved ones. Because we saw in here, and that's why I say this for those who follow Jesus, our interpretive lens is Jesus. It, you know, it's not, Scripture can contradict and be on different sides of things. We've talked about that before. So when we read Scripture, we read it through the eyes of Jesus, through his ministry, through his life, and through his love. And guess what? When Jesus was up on the cross and he stretched out his arm, he didn't do it for straight people only. He didn't do it for just the men. He didn't do it just for the Hebrew nation. He didn't do it just for this group or that group. He stretched out his arms for everyone Matthew records that Jesus said, Come unto me, all who labor and are heavy laden. That's all of us. Every one of us. And I will give you rest. I will give you life. So being able to see for Bartimaeus was physically being able to, for being able to see for that crowd was to see beyond their limited interpretation of Scripture to seeing something new, that God indeed was in everyone, that God was not judging with suffering, that God indeed came to relieve our pain, whether it is physical or whether it is perceived. Let us pray. We thank you, wondrous God, for your love, your life, for the whole world. We thank you that you have sent your love into the world in Jesus to be our guide, our light, to enable us to hear and to see clearly. 
And even though we don't get it right so many times, you do not give up on us, but you continue to be there for us, with us, and you will not give up on us. May we live each day opening our eyes more and more to your very presence in the world around us. In Jesus' name, amen. trumpet sound or may I then in him be found dressed in his righteousness alone faultless man before the And so may we go through this week with our eyes and ears a little bit more open to the joys and the cries of those around us who, underneath it all, are really us. And as you go, may God bless you and keep you. May God make God's face to shine upon you and be gracious unto you. 
May God lift up God's favor upon you and bring you peace now and always. Amen.